Hi. Well, welcome everyone to Drakeville Museum and Parks Winter Academy. Um, we have joining us this evening, um, the Venango Museum. My name is Sarah Goodman. I'm the museum educator here and I will be uh, at Drakewell and I'll be your moderator. For those of you that might be unfamiliar with Drakewell, we are the birthplace of the modern petroleum industry. We're located in Titusville, Pennsylvania. And we are one of several historic sites owned by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. We preserve, interpret, and interpret the sites of Drake Well, chronicling the birth and development of the petroleum industry in Pennsylvania and its growth into a global enterprise. This evening, we are pleased to have join us, you join us for this event, and we'd like to thank Brandon of the Venango Museum for presenting and helping us wash away the winter blues um, and discover more about our rich uh, oil region. I would also like to thank the Friends of Drakewell Incorporated for helping bring this uh, program to you. Just a few little logistics and reminders. Uh, your cameras and your microphones will remain off during the presentation. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat um, or in the Q&A section. Um, if I can answer them during the presentation, I will. Otherwise, we'll save um, answers for the end of the presentation. So without further ado, um, let's have Brandon present to us. He has a presentation to show us. So we'll have him share our screen. Um, so I will now turn my camera off and my mic off and turn it over to Brandon. Okay. All right, so hopefully everyone can see my screen here. Um, so my name's Brandon and I am the executive director here at the Venango Museum of Art, Science and Industry. And I have been director here for a little over two years now, um, but I've worked here at the museum since 2016 as the museum assistant. So um, I've been here at the museum for a little um, under eight years now. And as director here at the museum, um, I do a little bit of any and everything here. Um, I oversee our day-to-day -day operations. I work with our visitors. I manage our collections, displays, and exhibits. Um, sometimes I'm a tour guide. I plan all of our events and all of our fundraisers. I do maintenance work as it arises. And like I said, I tend to pretty much just fill in anywhere and everywhere as needed on a day-to-day -day basis depending on what's going on at the museum on any given day. And I also work with my assistant as well as several volunteers to help manage the museum overall as a whole. And so we are actually located um, just a few miles south of Drakewell on Seneca Street here in Oil City. And the museum is open April through December each year. And we do close for the winter months, January through March. So we are actually closed to visitors right now. And we are a private nonprofit museum. So our day-to-day -day operations are entirely privately funded. And most of our support does come from Venango County residents. And we do raise most of our operating money ourselves through fundraising and events here, which goes to keeping our doors open. So we really do exist here because of our community and the ongoing support that they've shown us throughout the years through everything that we do here um, pretty much at the museum. And here at our museum, we collect and exhibit materials of historical interest for our county's visitors and residents. And we promote the county as a place of historical, recreational, and scenic interest, as well as educating visitors and residents about the significance of the county. And so our collection here at the museum consists mainly of items and materials related to the industrial companies and operations that have been here in the county throughout time. And most of our collection is made up of items donated to us by our county's residents. And we, of course, have quite a bit of material relating to the oil centric companies, such as Penn's Oil, um, Quaker State, and Wolf's Head. Um, those three companies in particular were all oil refining companies, and they all have their roots in Venango County, specifically the Oil City, Emlinton, and Reno areas. And a notable part of our collection also consists of oil well supply 
um, company and oil history photographs. For anyone who might be unfamiliar, Oil Well Supply was a large company once located in Oil City beginning in the 1860s. And they supplied equipment and machinery to oil and gas drillers and producers worldwide. And our museum has one of the largest known oil well supply um, photographic collections made available to us through the Petroleum History Institute. And that collection consists of thousands of individual photographs digitized from negatives and glass plates, mainly from around the early to mid 1900s. And on screen here, I included a few photos that are from that oil well supply collection, as well as a couple photos from our Pennzoil collection. And um, on the right here is actually one of my favorite photos from our oil well um, collection. Um, so it shows oil well supply workers producing shells for the army during World War II. And during the war, oil well supply turned to producing munitions for the, arm, the army here at their factory in Oil City. And you can also see in the picture there that there is a woman working in the factory. And um, a lot of industrial operations had to have um, women um, to begin working in the factories for the first time during this time period because there was a shortage of male workers because they were um, off at war. Um, but besides oil, we also have some materials relating to companies such as Oil City Glass, Enjoy Manufacturing, um, just to name a couple. We also have art in our collection featuring some work from notable local artists such as Wealth of Bar Van Osdale and Keith Alba. And we, of course, have stuff that'd be of general interest to residents of the county, such as items and materials relating to the histories of various communities and towns, such as Oil City, Franklin and Emlinton, and a few places in between. Um, we do have a bit of that sort of stuff which is a bit of an eclectic mix, but the bulk of the items that we generally collect have to do with either the industrial activities in the county or within the realm of the arts. And so we were formed in 1961. And so the museum will be turning 63 years old this year in August. Initially, the museum began in a small building on 12th Street in Franklin next to the Franklin Public Library. And on the left here, you can um, see a photo of our original brick building. And for everyone who is familiar with Franklin, this building actually still does stand today. It is now the present day location of a shop called the Printer's Cabinet and Curiosities. And the museum at that time was called the Venango County Museum, and it primarily featured displays focused on the French and British forts built in Franklin during the mid 1700s near the French Creek and Allegheny River. And down on the bottom of the bottom right of your screen, you can see a model of one of the forts that was once on display in the museum when it was in Franklin. And the British, they built their fort called Fort Venango to control the passage um, from the French Creek to the Allegheny River. And this fort, it initially served as a um, sort of inspiration um, for early individuals who were involved here at the museum. They wanted to see the museum grow and expand, which meant searching for a newer and larger facility. And this is where Fort Venango comes in. The original plans for the museum's expansion was to actually reconstruct Fort Venango in Franklin. The reconstruction included plans for an officer's quarter building and a blockade house to house exhibit areas for visitors to explore. And on the right here, you can see a drawing of that planned reconstruction in the upper right. And ultimately, though, these plans for the reconstructed port were scrapped because acquiring property near the Allegheny River and the French Creek was impossible due to the railroad. And after these initial plans fell through, existing locations throughout the county were looked into for a new home for the museum. And this leads us to finding our present day location here in Oil City back in the 1980s. So we're now located within what is known as the historic US Federal Building here in Oil City. And the museum moved into this building in 1985 after the federal government declared the building a surplus. And honestly, I think that being able to work inside this building is one of my favorite parts of my job. Um, first of all, it's just a really big, cool old building, but it also has a lot of history in it within itself. The building's construction was completed in 1906 under the direction of an architect named James Knox Taylor, who is pictured here on screen. 
Um, James Knox Taylor, he was the supervising architect for the United States Department of Treasury, and his name is listed as supervising architect on hundreds of federal buildings built throughout the United States um, during this time period. Um, other buildings that he's listed on include the Ellis Island Immigrant Hospital located in New York Harbor, as well as both the Philadelphia and Denver Mints, where all the coinage for the United States is produced. And our building was listed in the Beaux Arts architectural style, which is a French style of architecture popular from around the 1830s to the end of the 19th century. And the Beaux Arts style is most notable for its sculptural decorative details. And you can see a little bit about um, what I mean by the sculpture work by looking above our windows on the front of the building. In the bottom left here on the slide, I included an up close photo of some of the sculpture work so you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. And due to the significance of, our, of the building's architecture, our building was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1977. Um, but the original purpose of our building was to be the Oil City Post Office, and it was the post office for almost 60 years until 1963. And a lot of visitors who come into the museum today, um, they comment on the size and the scale of the building when it was originally meant to be a post office, but the building had to be this large and kind of impressive um, structure as it was due to our area's impress or significant industrial activities. So the post office basically needed to be able to handle a large volume of mail each and every day. And after the post office relocated in the 1960s, various other government agencies had offices located in our building, um, such as Selective Services and the IRS. Um, but to this day, I still get quite a few visitors into the museum who tell me all about the time that their family members worked here when it was a post office. I actually do still get some people on occasion trying to bring in packages or letters to mail them with me here at our front desk, even though our building has now not been a post office longer than it actually was a post office. And I do get men who come in and tell me about the time they signed up for the military here when it was selective services. They tell me how there'd be a bus out front that they'd go um, get on that would take them to go train to begin their service eventually. And these people between the post office and selective services, they get quite emotional telling me their stories. So our building still definitely holds a lot of significance for our community to this day. And I'm glad that we here at the museum can act as a kind of steward for the building to ensure that it's here for future generations to come. And before the museum did move into the building in the 80s, a lot of restoration and repair work was done. And you can see a little bit of that restoration work um, in these before and after photos that I included over on the right there. Um, that is a photo of our um, ceilings in our front entrance area. And so if you visit us here today in Oil City, you will see three main exhibits. We are also home to the Oil City Visitor Center, which is maintained by the Oil Region Alliance. And the Visitor Center has a small exhibit detailing Oil City's past as the transportation and financial trading center of the early oil industry. And the Visitor Center also features information on all things to do and all places to see here in the oil region. And we also have a small gift shop where we try to keep items of local interest stocked for our visitors to purchase. But the first exhibit that you'll see here is called Oil, Black Gold or Black Magic. The exhibit did open in 2003, but we have done periodic updates to it throughout the years. And the exhibit is all about the modern oil industry and how it has its roots here in um, Venango County. And it's also, um, it touches upon the sciencey side of things as well, um, as about how oil has an impact on everything to the economy, to politics and the environment. And the exhibit consists of 10 displays discussing everything from the Seneca people and their ties to oil here in our region to some of the more quirkier and eccentric figures who lived in our area at the height of the oil boom. And so one of the first displays that you'll see um, here within this exhibit is all about a man called Rattlesnake Pete. And I'll tell you just a little bit about Pete. Um, he lived in Oil City in the early days of the oil industry and he owned and operated the first museum here in the 1890s. His museum featured a lot of bizarre oddities and curiosities, 
He had everything from a four-legged chicken to an eight-legged lamb, and he showed a lot of live snakes in his museum. And he also showcased items from the oil industry, um, such as models of oil derricks, which is pictured here. Um, his real name was Peter Gruber. However, he was called Rattlesnake Pete because he reportedly survived numerous rattlesnake bites throughout his life. And he spent many days in the woods surrounding the Oil City area with his friends searching for rattlesnakes. And he learned from his, um, he learned, he and his friends learned about the valuable medical treatments that could be obtained from using snakes. And so Pete, he tried to use snakes to treat everything from earaches to deafness and even blood poisoning. And there are actually uh, many records of Pete wrapping live snakes around people's throats. Um, he did this in order to um, cure a thing called a goiter, which a goiter is basically an enlarged thyroid gland. And while there's no proof that wrapping snakes around people's necks can cure them, um, many people who had been treated by Pete often claimed that he did actually help them. Um, I just know personally that I would not like a snake wrapped around my neck for any reason, but that's just me. Um, but along with Rattlesnake Pete, one of the most popular things here at our museum is our 1928 Wurlitzer Theater organ. Um, our Wurlitzer originally came from the Latonia Theater on Oil City Southside. The theater opened in 1929 and it showed movies and our organ was used specifically to show silent films in the theater. And so there would be an organist who would accompany the film playing all the film's score and sound effects. And the Latonia was very popular for many years, but it ultimately fell into financial problems during the 1960s and it closed before the end of that decade. And we here at the museum acquired the organ in 1988 and thousands of hours of volunteer and professional labor were required to restore the organ, including more than 600 separate pipes and numerous sound effects and percussion instruments. And along with acquiring the organ, we also um, received the theater's two large peacock decorations, which are also on display um, on our main floor. And one of them is pictured here off to the right of, on the screen here. And the peacocks, they are made of horsehair plaster and colorful um, Austrian crystal beads make up their feathers. And the peacocks um, covered the organ's pipe chambers inside of the theater, which you can see in the photo. Um, in the bottom center of the screen here, you can see the peacock mounted up on the wall on the upper left hand portion of the photo. And now the next thing I'm going to show you on screen, um, it's a short, um, about a minute long video with a musician named Nathaniel. Um, Nathaniel, he played a virtual concert for us on our Wurlitzer during the pandemic for people to enjoy at home during the lockdown. And hopefully my internet works and the video won't be choppy. Um, so sorry in advance if it lags a little bit, but like I said, it's only about a minute long, so hopefully we can get through it. Um, so I'll go ahead and get that started here. Hopefully that played okay for everyone. Um, that clip is just a short segment of a longer performance here at the museum. If anyone's interested, you can find the full performance with Nathaniel, which is about a half hour in length on our website, along with a bit more info on the organ in the Latonia Theater itself. And you can actually also visit the museum when we're open April through December, and I or one of my volunteers can give you a live demonstration of the organ during your visit if you'd like. 
Um, but here at the museum, we also have a second exhibit, which is all about the history of the Pennzoil Company. Um, the exhibit serves as a sort of timeline of the history of the company as it pertains to the Venango County area. The exhibit begins in 1886 with the creation of the Penn Refining Company and continues all the way to the eventual closure of the Pennzoil Refinery in Rouseville in the year 2000 after 114 years of continuous use. In the late 1980s, we received a collection of early oil refinery items and documents to commemorate the Pennzoil Company's 100th anniversary, and we received over 250 items from Pennzoil itself, as well as Pennzoil employees, including early oil cans and bottles, photographs, ledgers, advertising materials, and more, some of which is on display within this exhibit. Um, personally, I think that one of my favorite displays in the exhibit is, has to do with the Pennzoil baseball team called the Pennzips. So back in the um, 1930s, baseball was very popular here in the region, and oil refineries would often sponsor local teams, and they were constantly looking to stack their teams with good players. So within this Pennzoil exhibit, we have a display all about a man called Dick Turk, who is pictured here off to the left. Um, Dick, he was a catcher for the Oil City High School team, but Pennzoil actually ended up paying Dick to play for the Pennzips under a fake name so that he'd still be allowed to play on his high school team. And after graduating from high school, Pennzoil offered Dick a job at the refinery in Rouseville so that he could continue to play for them on their team. And he became the foreman in the barrel house and he worked for Pennzoil for 45 years before retiring. And along with these two photos, we also have Dick's catcher's equipment on display here within this exhibit. And while I'm talking about baseball, that brings me to our third exhibit area. Um, so we have a third space here dedicated to our changing exhibit area. Each year we develop a new exhibit for this space. And historically speaking, we have always tried to reach out to members in our community, the general public to loan us items that fit a theme for the exhibit that we choose and develop here at the museum. In recent years, we've had everything from an exhibit um, on the celebration of the City of Oil City's 150th anniversary to an exhibit about the early inhabitants of our region. Um, most recently in 2023, we had an exhibit called Venango Legends and Lore, which featured a collection of strange and unexpected stories that our everyday visitors and residents may not know from the Venango County area. The exhibit covered everything from John Wilkes Booth and his time spent in Franklin. Um, there he tried to strike it big in the oil industry several months before he assassinated Abraham Lincoln. The exhibit also discussed the connection between the oil industry and the American spiritualism movement, mainly how some early industry investors in the Pleasantville area participated in seances and attempted to communicate with the dead in order to find oil reserves. The exhibit was meant to sort of shine a light on stories that our local residents might not expect that happened here in the region where they lived. And the Legends and Lore exhibit did close at the end of 2023. And so we are currently developing a new exhibit to replace it with, which will open in April of this year. The exhibit will be all about baseball in the oil region. This new exhibit will provide an overview of the history of baseball in the Venango area in connection to our industrial past. Um, so it'll be from around the end of the Civil War till about the 1950s. And the exhibit will highlight um, some of the various players, teams, games, um, and whatnot played here throughout the region, um, such as Oil City's professional team called the Refiners back in the 1940s, which you can see some of the photos of the players um, from the Refiners on screen here, except for the top right, which is a photo of Babe Ruth. The exhibit will also cover Babe Ruth and the time he played a game here in Oil City. And the exhibit will also explore how a rivalry between the two towns of Oil City and Franklin was formed through baseball, um, mainly by a thing called the Two Team League. So over the past few months, we've been reaching out to our community here and we've been receiving loans and donations for this exhibit, such as jerseys, photos and other information. And overall, we have the changing exhibit space here at the museum to reach out to our community and encourage them to share their stories, as well as to encourage new um, potential and repeat visitors to the museum each year. So other than being here for visitors to enjoy our exhibits or displays, um, our museum also hosts several events and programs throughout the year. 
In recent years, we've had concert performances by local bands, such as the Pine Valley Boys. And last year, we actually had the Erie Philharmonic here. Um, they brought a string quartet to perform on our main exhibit floor. And thinking back to our Wurlitzer Theater Organ, we also try to host at least one program where the organ is the main feature each year. And this past Christmas season, we invited an organist to accompany several holiday themed silent films on the organ. And the organ, the organist played along with the films, playing all the films score and sound effects. And that tends to be a pretty popular program for us here at the museum as it's becoming increasingly rare to have the opportunity to see silent films in the way they were originally intended to be seen with the live accompaniment on the organ. And we've also sometimes hosted historians to give talks. Like last year, we had a program on Venango County's Monarch Park. Um, Monarch Park was an amusement park located midway between Oil City and Franklin around the turn of the 20th century. And the park was filled with attractions and entertainment for visitors of all ages. It had everything from a Ferris wheel, a roller coaster, and they often hosted many performers and entertainers at the park. So our program here was a part lecture um, and the other part featured period accurate music that would have been performed by entertainers at amusement parks ac across Western Pennsylvania, such as Monarch Park. And we also periodically host our antique appraisal luncheon. We have a catered lunch with our attendees who all bring antique items from home to be appraised in a classroom like setting with our three appraisers. The event has kind of been described as a light version of Antique Roadshow, if anyone's familiar with that program. It's meant to mainly help people learn a little bit more about the item that they choose to bring with them from home. And we also have a few programs geared towards our local students each year. Um, each spring, we offer free tours of the museum to elementary schools and other children's organizations. And we take the kids through the exhibits here at the museum. And it's a good way for the kids to learn a little bit more about their own local history here. And along with the tours, we also have our summer workshop series for kids that center around STEM and music activities each year. These summer workshops, they've been building and growing over the past few years, especially. And we've worked with um, teachers from the Oil City Area School District to develop and lead these workshops for us. And we hope to continue to expand and grow these um, workshops in the future too. And we also partner with several other businesses and organizations um, on events and programs that we offer here at the museum. Um, I believe by far our most popular event has to be um, tours of River Ridge Mansion. Um, the mansion is pictured here on the upper left of your screen. Um, we, partnered, um, we partner with an organization called Life Ministries who are the current owners of the mansion um, to offer a couple tours throughout the year. Um, the mansion is located in the Franklin area, and it was once the residence of a man called Joseph Sibley. He was the co-founder of a company called Galena Signal Oil, and he was a very wealthy man and friends with very powerful people such as J.D. Rockefeller and a couple presidents like President McKinley and President Woodrow Wilson. Um, but besides Life Ministries, um, we also partner with various schools, businesses, clubs, and other organizations. We ask them to decorate Christmas trees throughout the museum each year. Um, service clubs sponsor our Christmas tree display so we can then offer free admission to all visitors during the holiday season every year. And our Christmas tree display is a good way to encourage people to visit the museum. And it's also a good way for organizations and businesses to advertise or promote themselves to our visitors with the trees that they decorate. And each year we also partner with restaurants all throughout the county for a contest um, during the summer months called the best sandwich in the county. We ask local restaurants to enter a sandwich that either already exists on their menu or a sandwich that they create specially just for the contest. Their sandwich is then tried and voted upon by people who purchase best sandwich entry cards from us here at the museum. And the entry cards entitle card holders to try one each of all the sandwiches at 50% off. Last year, we had 17 participating restaurants from all over the county. Um, Woods and River Coffee in Oil City won the contest with their breakfast sandwich last year, which down in the left hand corner there is Erin, who is the co-owner of Woods and River. Um, she's there with her trophy. 
Um, the contest does act as a sort of fundraiser for the museum, but it's also meant to help um, promote and support our local restaurants as well. And so, like I said earlier, we are a small museum, so we do raise a big portion of our own money to operate. We do have monthly fundraisers like card parties, but each year in October, we have our big A Night at the Museum Gala that consists of a cocktail hour, live music on our Wurlitzer theater organ, and various auctions all to support the museum. The gala is our biggest fundraiser for the museum every year, and I'm always amazed by the amount of support that we receive um, from our community for the event. And so that's a little bit on some of the programs and events that we have here at the museum each year. Um, I am working on our 2024 schedule right now, and I'll hopefully be able to announce some of those events soon for our next upcoming season. Um, but yeah, um, with that, um, that's what I have for you all tonight. Um, I'll just end with a quick thank you to Sarah and to Drake Well for inviting me to speak a little bit about our museum here in Oil City with you all. So thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Um, does anyone have any questions for Brandon? I know I have one and that question is, are there any remnants of the post office still visible? Uh, like mail slots or mailboxes when so, you tour through the museum? Yeah, there's nothing um, like super obvious like in your face in our building like that. Um, but our building does have a couple kind of like, I don't know if it's a stretch to call them secret passages, but um, like kind of in um, like upstairs where we keep our collection there is like a hidden room where apparently the postal inspectors used to come and they would spy on the postal employees like the clerks at the front desk to make sure they weren't stealing anything so there's nothing like overly obvious like in connection to the post office i mean on the front of our building it does say united states post office on it which right. i think leads to some of that confusion that i was talking about with people um trying to bring in boxes and letters to mail with us but other than that like a lot of it's kind of like not right in your face, um, overtly obvious um, with the post office. Okay. Yeah, I, I was just pretty curious about that, wondering if I've, I've been to your museum and things for meetings and, and briefly have visited, but I've never like spent a lot of time there really going through all the exhibits and kind of looking around and seeing what you got. But your presentation tonight has made me want to go down and, and really explore now and learn more. Sure. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any questions for Brandon? Yeah, Brandon, this is Michael here. Um, and you may have said this and I may have missed it, but how many visitors do you guys get a year? So we get around um, 3000 visitors and guests to the museum each year. Okay. And, and are most of them local or do you have people traveling in to see? Um, I will say, so for us, our visitors are always people from out of town um, and our local community are the ones that come to our events and stuff. Um, but most of our visitors are from like, it seems like Pittsburgh, Cleveland areas, um, kind of like in the immediate region, but a lot of them are from out of town. All right, great. Yeah, like Sarah said, your presentation was was very good this evening and definitely makes me want to get down and take it in firsthand. I also am very much looking for it. I, I admired the organ when I was there for one of the meetings and I was so tempted to play it, but it when I was down there for a meeting, it was getting a getting a repair, um, but it really makes me wish that I had stuck with my piano lessons so I could be like, Brandon, I can play this organ. Let me let me, you know, yeah, I try. wish that I was talented enough to play the organ. It is automated whenever I say that I can give you a demonstration of the organ um, during a visit. It is automated. Um, oh. We have a programmed box and we can play. Um, I think that there's. 36 different songs we can choose from um, on there and um, all of them kind of range um, in 
like differences of what they can show like some of them are just strictly with like the pipes like pipe music and stuff but then there's some that really do show um it's called the toy cabinet where all the sound effect and sound effect instruments are located and stuff and a lot of them do show that off um so we try to um there's the national anthem that we usually play and that does a good um job of kind of showing those instruments off um during the demonstration i'm i'm really curious now i'm gonna have to <laughs> i'm gonna have to come to some of the programs does anyone else have any questions or comments or anything for for brandon or or for myself That's a very good program i really enjoyed it thank you thank you anyone else well i want to thank everybody so much for joining us this evening um just to let you know, um, the next Winter Academy is actually going to be on February 29th, and it's going to be done by Ivy Kuberry, who is the education, um, environmental education specialist at Oil Creek State Park. And she's going to talk about how oil changed the landscape of the area. Um, it should be a really informative talk and looking forward to it. Um, and then also just to note, our um, Wisdom and Wine series is coming up in March. Uh, each Thursday evening in March will be in person. Um, and I'm also, with the speaker's permission, hoping to record some of those too and have those available to you on our YouTube channel. Tonight's program, if you want to um, reference back on things, um, it is recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel um, hopefully within the next week, um, if technology behaves for me and allows me to download the video properly. So wish me luck on that. But I just want to thank everybody for um, joining us this evening and look forward to seeing you at more programs and events. And Brandon, you're going to have, I think, a field trip from all of the Drake Well people coming down and exploring. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It was great to see everyone and have a wonderful evening.